to the point with Congressman Bill Pascrell, focusing on the concerns and issues facing the families of New Jersey's 9th Congressional District. Hello, I'm Congressman Bill Pascrell. I'd like to welcome you to the latest edition of To the Point. Our country is long overdue for meaningful tax reform that helps middle and working class families succeed. For too long, the American middle class has seen wages remain stagnant, while special interest groups in the wealthy have exploited the system to their own benefit. Democrats have been fighting to give the American people what they want, a fair tax code for everybody, which will provide relief to the middle class and put Americans back to work in good paying jobs. That's what we want. Unfortunately, we have not been able to walk a bipartisan road on tax reform. The Republican tax plan at first passed in the Ways and Means Committee provides large corporations with about $2 trillion in tax giveaways while dismantling a number of middle-class tax relief provisions. Most notably, in my state, the state and local tax deduction, better known as SALT, which provides a long-standing measure of relief, a deduction for over 44 million Americans throughout this great country. According to the Tax Policy Center, the largest beneficiaries of the Republican tax plan be higher earners, especially millionaires and billionaires, many of whom have come out against the tax plan anyway. <laughs> it would appear that the Republicans are dead set on increasing taxes on working Americans while giving huge breaks to our nation's top earners, including the president himself many of his cabinet members. For those who are well acquainted with the particulars of tax policy, like my guest, this Republican attempt at providing tax cuts for the wealthy may seem all too familiar. Representing Massachusetts' first congressional district, Congressman Richard Neal is with us today. Congressman Neal is a former teacher like myself, served as president of the Springfield City Council. I was a councilman, I was a mayor before him being elected uh, in, what, when he was mayor, 1983, that's when he was sworn in. He has been a member of the House of Reps since 1988, and I've had the pleasure of serving with him on the House of Ways and Means Committee since 2007, in which he serves as the ranking Democrat. He's my boss. Congressman <laughs> Neal has been a leader on economic policy for an emphasis on tax reform. And I want to start off with this question, if I may. Very important question. Where are their heads? This is a nonpartisan program. I've had Republicans on, Democrats on, Richie. I know you're, you're a straight guy. You'll say it like it is. Where, what do they want to accomplish by the tax bill that by this time the viewers will see it will have passed the House of Representatives and the Senate will, we will work and debate their bill. What, what do they intend to accomplish with this bill? Well, I think as they dismantle many of the middle-class benefits that are currently in the tax code, they've advertised this as a pro-growth economic agenda. But when you have a chance to sort through the details of what they're proposing, you quickly come to a different conclusion. I can't for the life of me understand how you would want to take away the student interest loan deduction. I can't understand why you would want to shave back the mortgage interest deduction. I can't understand why you would want to take away the state and local tax deduction. Those are all very important to the middle class. When, when we were starting out looking at homes for the first time, the rule of thumb for all of us was that you should never buy a home that was more than 25% of your income. That's correct. Well, that's all changed now for many young people across the country. They're putting 35 and 40% into the home because that is not only their most important asset, but it's their bank account. Right. And I think with this argument that all of a sudden you can shave back the mortgage interest deduction, two essentially provide a tax cut for people at the very top by repealing the estate tax and the alternative minimum tax, which only 4.5 million Americans pay, right. and they're all, for the most part, upper-income Americans, and the estate tax. We, we took care of the middle class and the alternative minimum tax a few years back. Two years ago. The so middle class doesn't pay AMT the, anymore. Now we're dealing with the Trumps of the world. You, that's exactly right. And You're, what happens uh, with this... Uh, doing away with the AMT for those folks. Well, they abolish it. But right. when you Remember, when you do tax reform, you need money. Right. So if you take this revenue stream away from the federal government, then you have to go someplace else in to the tax code because, after all, we do have to support Social Security and Medicare and our military and our veterans. All of those are parts of the obligations that we hold based on future contracts. 
And I think that in the instance that we're discussing here, the middle class is being asked to again sacrifice what they have right. so that we might get rid of the estate tax or we might get rid of the alternative minimum tax. Or for people in Patterson, New Jersey, I think that something that's again very relevant, the historic tax credit. Right. I mean, that's a lot. For our of, city, that's, that's a killer. That's allowed a lot of people who might have lived outside the city to decide that they wanted to come in and fix up an old brownstone or they wanted to redo a neighborhood. Right. So then that strengthens the tax base of Patterson while simultaneously bringing people back to the city who have a vested interest in the success of the city. And for the states that are high tax states because of services needed for the number of people that are there, the infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, what do we do? Lay off state troopers in New Jersey? In order to deal with, you can't use this as a deduction, the, the state and local taxes. That's a huge part of the revenue. Well, the other part of this that's entirely speculative, based upon the, the term maybe, this has been advertised as a pro-growth tax measure. That's what it has. They are guaranteeing that you're going to have growth north of 3%. You can't find a mainstream economist who says that that guarantee is to be embraced but this is what they're telling all of us. It didn't happen in 2001, 2003 tax cuts. It, in fact, we saw what the result of that was. There was negligible economic growth, the right. slowest since Herbert Hoover with the Bush tax and cuts. And then we had the right. collapse. Well, you had the collapse, but you also had $2.3 trillion taken out of the federal revenue stream. And then if you recall, by the time we got to 2004, the other idea that was going to be about pro-growth economics was repatriation. So there was a significant tax holiday. Talk about that briefly. Offshore. In our in our tax system, because we tax income on a worldwide basis, until that revenue that's made offshore is returned home, you don't have to pay tax on it. And when you do pay tax on it, you essentially take a tax credit against the revenue that you returned home, even though you bring it back. Right. And what happened was that money was said to be for job growth, a new economic plan, and it was brought back at 5.25%. That's all I had to pay on it. 20,000 people were laid off almost immediately. That's not your rate. That's not, That's not my, my rate. rate. That's right. It's not the people of the 1st District of Massachusetts. It's not, the, it's not the rate of the people in the 9th District of, the, of, the, of New Jersey, my district either, and many districts throughout this country. And the money was used for stock buybacks and dividends and salaries for people at the top. Now, I'm fine with that if you tell everybody that's what you're going to do with yeah. it. Yeah. Then let's have the argument, but we know this, it wouldn't pass. Right. But when you say we're going to bring it back for job creation and we're going to invigorate the economy right. Right. and encourage more risk-taking, none of that happened. Right. So you had three huge tax cuts during that period of time, and the result was, again, very slow economic Well, growth. that's what I'm getting, that they're saying because they're doing this for those one or two percenters or ten percenters, that that money is going to be invested in jobs. That did not happen in the past tax cuts that we've had. Why is it going to happen this time? It won't happen this time. None of the economists seem to, seem to think it'll happen. You have the Wharton School that says this is bogus. Right. You have, in addition to the Wharton School, you have Goldman Sachs and many Republican mainstream economists. Right. Doug Holtz Aiken. Right. You have Mark Zandi. Right. You have Bruce Bartlett, who They're authored. All Republicans. You, all Republicans. They are the ones that uh, Bruce Bartlett authored the, temp, the Jack Kemp tax cuts. He authored President Reagan's 1981 tax cut. He said this idea that is being promulgated, that tax cuts pay for themselves, is nonsense. Right. And yeah. what, what kind of a deficit, is? what kind of a hole in this deficit that this country has and is complaining about all the time, the, the hawks on, 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 on the hill? Well, they only complain when Bill Clinton's president That's right. or when Barack Obama's president. Right. So when Clinton leaves, let's take a look at in the rearview mirror. On January 19th of 2001, the budget had been balanced for four years in a row. Right. The most profound economic growth in American history occurred, right. 23 million new jobs and a $5 trillion projected surplus. Right. This is the trouble with making projections. Nobody could project the events of 911. Of course. Nobody at the time would have said later on that, oh, there's going to be a recession, that you're going to start losing 800,000 jobs a month at the That's end right. of the Bush years. You did. And you need a cushion. But because the money had been returned in the tax cuts, Advertised again is everybody getting a tax cut, but when you looked at the distribution tables, there was a very different conclusion. Of course. People at the top drew massive tax relief, and people at the bottom had very small uh, 
tax gratification after that. So when you get rid of all of these deductions that are really hurting people, the Alzheimer deduction for crying out, people have serious injuries, serious sicknesses, are no longer going to be able to deduct that. Well, not only that, we, re- insane. we regularly celebrate increases in American longevity. Yeah. We say, oh, isn't it great that now the average male, I think, is at uh, almost 80 years old and the average female is at 81, but those numbers keep going north. Right. But it also has a, another uh, tangible impact, and that is as people live longer, right. there's going to be more dementia. That's correct. There's going to be more Alzheimer's. Right. So they're saying essentially with this tax cut that you're on your own. That's exactly what they're saying. And the other place, you know, you take the inheritance tax, the right. estate tax. that they, They've convinced people over the last 10 years that everybody's going to get a windfall when Uncle Louie passes away or when your dad passes away, Father, God forbid. But the fact of the matter is we're only talking really about 5,200 families in the whole country. So they made people think this is the death tax, the government is killing you. When people aren't paying federal taxes, they might be paying some state taxes on your estate. That's a different thing. We have nothing to do with that. Only 5,200 families. And there are Democrats who want to remove farmers from that altogether over the past several years. The last compromise that we reached on the estate tax was that individuals could keep five and a half million dollars and a married couple could keep 11 million dollars. Without... Without any tax. Without, no, without any tax. I mean, Gary Cohn, who is the president's chief economic advisor, he recently said, and I quote, you got to be stupid to pay the estate tax. Anybody who knows anything about uh, tax law, you would know that uh, life insurance gets people around the estate tax. And the other right. part of it that I think is really important on the estate tax to acknowledge is that America is about upward mobility. Say it. <laughs> we don't live and work in the House of Lords, where peerage dominates based upon hereditary right. Instead, ours is, if you've got some ability and talent, you move. And I think that the problem with the estate tax as it sits is that it would create a permanent sense of aristocracy in America. The same people would go to the same medical schools and the same law schools and the same accounting schools. Right. I mean, the idea in America is you get a chance. Right. And I think that by maintaining the estate tax, it encourages more entrepreneurship and upward mobility we're and talk- more risk-taking. We're talking about a fair, a fair tax system. This is what the guys and gals worked on in 1985. Bill Bradley, State Center, I mean, United States Center from New Jersey, uh, Reagan, Tip O'Neill, Jack Kemp. They all worked on this. They worked hard. It was bipartisan from the very beginning. They had many hearings, right, Richard? They had... Over 400 witnesses or 200 you know, 450 witnesses. 450 witnesses. We had no witnesses. From the time that uh, Dick Gephardt and Bill Bradley filed the bill in 1982. Yeah, they there had were three th- years. They had 30 hearings, 450 witnesses, and the Secretary of the Treasury sat in the Ways and Means room. Where was Mnuchin, by the way, on our <laughs> hearings and Ways and Means? There, there was no representation. Well, I, right. defa- I was ready to jump down his throat. I'll be very yeah. honest with you. When he said that New Jersey is being subsidized by West Virginia, Alabama, and Louisiana. When we get 60, 70 cents back on a buck that we sell, every buck we send down there, and West Virginia gets $4.40 from right. every dollar they send down there, right. who's subsidizing whom? Look, we're in America. Charlie Raggle and I had a bill in 2007 to reduce the corporate taxes right. from 35 to 25. We thought that was fair at the time. That was our bill. It wasn't that we did we did anything. They had the majority. We at that time we had the majority. Let's do it. We couldn't get the cooperation to do it. W- why are we always being accused of being the tax and spend party? We want it be fair for the billionaire. We want it be fair for the guy that's a, a labor. We are taxing labor now. We are not taxing assets at what they used to be taxed. We're not taxing and that capital. Help the right. middle class. Uh, at a meeting at the White House in two thousand and one. Uh, within a matter of days after George W. Bush became president, he invited me to the uh, Oval Office to talk about taxes. Mm. And he told me what he was thinking of. And he asked me what I thought. Cheney was there, as was uh, Paul O'Neill, the Secretary of the Treasury. There were about seven or so of us in the room. And I said, you know, Mr. President, there's enough money there. Why don't we just do a middle-class tax cut and continue to pay down the debt? It was ignored. And when I look back at that, that was a moment 
where we could have really given the middle class a handsome right. tax cut. Yes. The, the rich in America at the time were not asking for a tax cut. They weren't asking for it now. They, their attitude is, look, the economy's doing okay. We'd like I'm it to do better. When I no, you're last right. Week, 400 of them, right. billionaires and millionaires, go, so we don't need this tax cut right now. Let's invest it. People in the middle class, they spend a tax cut. Right. People at the top, don't save it. They don't create jobs either. Oh, they save the they money. They create jobs a different way than yep. the one we're, we're trying to plan. Yep. And we're taking money out. This huge deficit is a burden on our children and our grandchildren. Well, it's $2.3 trillion that is being borrowed for the purpose of giving tax cuts to the people at the top. So it's really like taking this, the nation's revenue system to the right. casino. Yeah. And they're gambling. Maybe this will happen, but what happens if it doesn't? What happens if it doesn't? I want to talk about one other thing. We've been talking about the fact that American corporations are being taxed so high. I was over in Germany this summer. We did a whole economics symposium. The average corporation in the United States is not paying 35% taxes. It's paying 18, 18 and a half 18.5%. How are they doing that? It's by taking advantage of preferences, deductions, and exclusions in the tax code. And some of those, for good reason, are justified. And others are the work of clever advocates. <laughs> well, and I understand that. Yeah, they have every legal right. reason to do that. But it, that's right. People are not going to pay more than they have to. Right. I understand that. And there is a difference between tax evasion and tax right. avoidance. Right. Right. One of the problems we have now internationally is what we call stateless income. Right. It's profits that are booked in nations where there's virtually no rate at all. So all of a sudden, let's say you make the money in Berlin, but you decide to report the transaction as having taken place in Bermuda. Right. Because there's no corporate tax there. No corporate tax. And so that money just... So should we be, we be shocked when we see that Apple pays no federal taxes? Well, I think that what you look at is that they are now in a corrective period in Dublin, for example, where they had two addresses in, in uh, Dublin at one time. And recall that in our, <laughs> our, our system, we say we want to see economic substance. Right. That's the key term. Right. And stateless income at the time, there were two addresses, one of which there was no economic substance, and that's where the profit was booked. And... Uh, the Irish government, by the way, they've, they've begun to address this issue. Right. Can, can we force corporations to invest in jobs when we get them to bring the money back? No, you can't. And, and I, I think that that's something we need to be concerned about because I think there are going to be more stock buybacks and more dividend payments. And I think that it'll be reported as good management, which is right. fine. But I also think that the, uh, the more important consideration here is we had a chance in this round to invest in some human capital. The Labor Department reported this week that there were six million jobs available in America right now that go yeah, you've unanswered. you've spoken to this before. I want you to be very, very specific about this because it's very important for people here. We have a skill set problem in America. Part of it is due to globalization. Part of it is due to technology. Part of it is due to the gig economy. There's more temp work. Right. But one of the real challenges we have is that we don't have the workers that are capable of filling a lot of these jobs. You hear that? You hear that? And I think investment in community colleges, investment in internship programs, tech schools. and something that you and I, that's exactly right as mayor, we would both know, you can't even find teachers today to work in vocational schools. I know. And yet the economy is begging for vocational school graduates. Right. And I think that we went through a that's period- That's human capital. That's human capital. And I, I also think that uh, the rewards are immediate. We have 18,000 precision manufacturing jobs in New England right wow. now, the smallest geographic area of the country that averaged $65,000 right. a year. Paying jobs. Full benefits. That's right. Good benefits. We lost good paying manufacturing jobs. Uh, we want to get those good manufacturing jobs back as much as we can. We're never going to be the same manufacturing giant that we were. No, but there's a lot of manufacturing jobs that go Absolutely. wanting in America today, Absolutely. too. Absolutely. And we shouldn't be afraid of people getting their hands dirty. Mm -hmm. We want all of our kids to go to college. Many of them would do better in the field right. uh, by putting bread on the table if they had a skill, if they had a technical. There's nothing embarrassing about that anymore. Not only is there nothing embarrassing about it, uh, they tend to have great careers. Yeah. And, but it's going to require something beyond high school 
but maybe short of a bachelor's degree. We need welders. You need welders. We do need them. Sure do. Yeah. I want to ask you, well, I got you. Sure. What are we doing? What are we, you know, as ranking member of trade, I ask you this question, but as congressman to congressman and citizen to citizen, what the heck are we doing developing this trade policy? What is the trade policy? I've laid out principles for us to deal with. We need multilateral deals, yeah, not nation by nation. We wouldn't have enough time for that. How do you see, what, do you, what direction you see us going in in trade? Well, I, I think that uh, I was disappointed that we have not engaged TTIP, the trade agreement with Europe. I think that that has extraordinary potential. And it's right. hard to argue that they don't have a similar lifestyle. They live longer than we do. And many of their quality of life uh, calculations are pretty solid. Right. And they also tend to be seafaring people. They have the history of trade. So I think that there's an opportunity there to engage on TTIP. I'm okay with reviewing NAFTA. It's 23 years old. But let's not bomb it. But I don't think that it's a good idea for us to threaten Canada, <laughs> which is our number one trading partner. <laughs> we had our meeting with uh, a tr a Trudeau. That's right. And it proved to be very interesting the very things that he talks about in terms of labor and the environment, for instance, and security, cybersecurity, right down the line. We proved with the bilateral agreement with Peru that you could include environmental concerns, the right to organize right. a union, and human rights. Right. And they accepted it on and all three counts. It. And okay. I think that that's the... That's the standard that we ought to employ going forward. I mean, one of the things that we can guarantee in these agreements is the right to organize a union. Sure. And not a government-sponsored union. Right. That was the problem with uh, TPP. I think Vietnam right. was paying such a low wage. And, and I'm in favor of the idea of taking a tougher position on wages as it relates to Mexico as well. Oh, yeah. But, you know, America... They're paying, they're paying a buck ten right. per hour. America leads the way. And if we start to walk away from some of these agreements, you know, recently... If you recall, after the president uh, removed us from TPP, he said that uh, we could engage these bilateral agreements. And then after the Brits left Brexit, uh, used Brexit, the president said, we'll have a bilateral. Well, I want to assure you, by the time that starts and by the time it finishes, that'll be so far down the road, there'll be a different president. And that's all there is to it. It takes years to do yeah. these things. Yeah. The wage thing is very, very important. Yeah. We, we need to put pressure on anybody we... we, we and, and Canada doesn't have any pro problems with that, I think. No, they don't. I think the way Trudeau is going is very interesting. Their next round, which is going on, I think, next week. The uh, fifth round. Yeah, uh, is being in, be in Mexico. Right. And, and we will learn. We are trying to stress the fact of Article 1, Section 8. The Congress makes the trade deals. Mm -hmm. And the administration has its role as well. I think in the past, under Democratic and Republican presidents, we've been very hesitant to second guess the administration, whomever it was. I don't think that's good for us either. Well, I also think that part of the, the problem that we have with trade today is that we suggest by some of our positions that we don't think we can compete in the world. We can we compete can. in the world. Darn right. Nobody does innovation. Productivity, productivity. Right. Nobody does innovation and creativity the way we do. One of the challenges we have today in the modern world is that you can do production anywhere. Right. They replicate what we create and they sell it cheaper because it's years down the road. I mean, yeah. that's the example of the iPhone. Look at China. You know, China yeah. is manufacturing more of the products that come to the United States from other countries. But they don't they're, invent them. No. They're, <laughs> they're in other countries. They're all over the place. Yeah. We need to compete with them. Uh, tr uh, Obama warned us right. if we don't get now. I was against the TPP for a number of reasons. Sure. We could have worked this out. All right. Well, the other part of it is that I think you correctly note is that why would we not be working with Australia, we're forfeiting that to that part of the world in Asia. They're an ally. In India. Yeah. Why wouldn't we be engaging right. in that sort of a back and forth Absolutely. to make it work? And and I also think that uh, the danger is that if we walk away, it creates a huge void. You've been a very strong advocate of trade. Uh, I've been a strong advocate of fair trade, and yeah. never the train shall meet. But the question of the matter is, how do we get all these sides together? The 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 chairman of the trade uh, subcommittee, good friend of mine, Dave Riker, Republican from Washington, who's retiring, by the way, he's reluctant to have meetings because his president is nowhere as near what he's thinking about trade. How do, 
I, I'm closer to the president on trade than he is many times. Well, if you live on the East Coast of the United States uh, and you consider the day-to-day -day activities that take place at, for example, the Port of Boston, right. Logan Airport, uh, our economy in Massachusetts is one-third trade-related. There you go. I mean, those are the kinds of statistics. So I understand reshaping them to our satisfaction, but I use the other example of Panama. Why would we not have a trade agreement with Panama? I mean, you just they just got done doubling the size of the Panama Canal. Right. And now we're which all... Which us. Right, which we're all competing now for dollars so that we can dredge our ports up and down the East Coast right. because those tankers are going to come up the East Coast. So I think that that's a very sensible trade policy. And by the way, Panama has a decent living standard. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Decent living standard. You know, we, we go back to the campaign last year and the president bla blasted all these trade deals. I voted against some of those trade deals. I did too, sure. But the, fact, but the fact of the matter is you can't just destroy it and then figure that you're going to deal each country at a time. When, that's not going to happen. We need to deal with the sections of the country of of the world, and, and many times we have this multilateral agreement that or, or possible agreement that we could work with them. So I think when you look at TTIP, you probably would agree with ninety five percent of what's in there. Yeah, what's TTIP? Tell our, our TTIP audience. is uh, the agreement that we would have with Europe, right? European Union, and why I we think would we not, got a shot, a good with, shot. And why we would not have a trading relationship with Europe That's is beyond insane. me. Yeah. That's what was part of our discussion was when I went to Germany. This 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 summer, I mean, they getting they're getting mixed signals, right. and that's like, look, Richie, I really believe that uh, your presence. And I'm not blowing smoke, you know. When I disagree with you, I disagree with you. You let people know when you disagree. <laughs> yeah. No, but you you have been such a a breath of fresh air on the Ways and Means Committee as a, as the leader of the Democrats, and you you know you've always worked with the other side, which is which you all want to do. We never had a shot on this tax deal. No, right. that was the problem. We were. They didn't want us. To. They didn't want us there. They didn't want us there. And you know, the chairman had his way. And this is not bipartisan by any stretch. I'm glad the American people are with us on this. Even they could pass all the bills that they want. They said, "Let's get a victory, and then find a policy." Well, they needed a victory. This may not be the one they're looking for. Right. I don't know, but they have it now. Yeah. I want to thank you for watching this edition to the point. R Richie Neal was a great guest today. This typical. A topic, typical. <laughs> this topic is timely, but complicated, and I appreciate your attention. You've heard our thoughts, and I want you to hear what you think about today's show. So, if you have any comments, concerns, or questions, stay tuned. Our address, our phone number, the email address will appear on the, in, in a moment. You know, I'd love to hear from you guys and gals. Call in, write in, whatever you got to do. Thanks again for tuning in. I'm going to see you on the next time on To the Point.